And yet many people will live and die without ever having read the Bible. Now, the Bible is actually a library of books. You have 66 books in the Bible, 1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses, 773,746 uh, 7, 7, 3, words, 3,566,480 letters. Now, I didn't count those, so if they're not right, the source I read was, was off. But it's, the point is, there's a lot of material here. You can read the entire Bible at pulpit speed, which is 200 words a minute. You can read faster to yourself, but if you're reading out loud, you can read the entire Bible in 70 hours. Now that's a lot of time if you try to do it all at once, but spread out over a year, that's not, that's not um, difficult at all. In fact, if you read four chapters a day, you'll read the entire Bible in one year. If you read 15 minutes, if you're an average reader and you read 15 minutes a day, you'll complete the Bible in one year. 15 minutes, that's not even as long as you would sit down and watch a television show, half the length of you know, the shortest television show that you might watch. And so the Bible is not a book that is difficult to read it's not a book that's difficult to understand, but it is a book that must be read in order to be understood. You know, you can't sleep with it under your pillow and somehow come to a knowledge of the Bible. You can't just sit in a pew and listen to someone talk about the Bible and never read it for yourself. Philippians 2.12 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I'm grateful for preachers that explain the Word of God to us. But Acts 17.11 says that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Now, who was their preacher? Paul. If they needed to check up on Paul, then you need to check up on Victor, and you need to check up on Alan. You need to read it in your own Bible. And, and no uh, gospel preacher worth his salt minds. In fact, he will encourage you to open your Bible as he's preaching, and to jot down the references to do your own Bible study. Now, in order to do that, though, we really need to have the overall view of the Bible first. What you might call the 50,000 feet view, the airplane view of the Bible, when you look down and you can see the entire Bible at one time, then it's easier to make sense of one book of the Bible or of one chapter of the Bible or a verse of the Bible because then you see it in its larger picture, you see it in its larger context. So that's what we're going to do tonight. It's very valuable to go through the Bible slowly and even at the word level, word by word, but this is not that kind of lesson. This is the fly over it kind of lesson where you look at the entire thing in one lesson. So let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and then turn back one page and you'll have a page that looks something like this. It says... Mine has the New Testament. Yours might say the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or something like that. Now the reason I ask you to turn there is a lot of people have never discovered that page in their Bible. There is a page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it is vital to know that in order to make sense of the Bible. You cannot obey the Old Testament and the New Testament at the same time. You can either obey the Old Testament or the New Testament, but you can't do both. In fact, you, you can't obey the Old Testament now anyway because we don't have the record of the tribes of Israel, and even if we did, your, your name probably wouldn't be in it because you're most likely a Gentile. So the Old Testament, as we'll see momentarily, has, a valuable, has valuable lessons to teach us, but we don't obey the Old Testament Today, we obey the New Testament. So you have these two sections. Now, what I'd like for you to do, I'm going to give you a map of where we're going tonight. Three simple points. First one, an overview of the Old Testament. Second point, the day the transition occurred between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in fact, if I don't forget, you can remind me, Victor, I could give you the hour that the law changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament from your Bible. And then the third point is an overview of the New Testament.
So very simple outline, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Here we go. Let's, let's look at the Old Testament. Now, well, I asked you yesterday, if you were here, to bring uh, your physical copy of the Bible. So if you have a physical copy of the Bible tonight, I would like for you to hold your Bible in your hands. And I have the Old Testament and the New Testament here first. But now I want you to take just the Old Testament and put in your right hand the book of Genesis. So find Genesis 50 or Exodus 1 and hold those pages in one hand and hold the rest of the Old Testament in your other hand. That is Exodus chapter 1 through the book of Malachi. Now when you, when you have that, it will look something like, let's see, two-thirds of the Bible is Old Testament, about one-third is New Testament. What you have in your hand combined is 929 chapters. 23,145 verses. There's only 7,900 in the New Testament. So you see there's about twice as many uh, in the Old Testament. 23,000, more than twice as many. 23,145. Uh, now, that's what you have if you put both of them together. But now, I still haven't got to Mount. There it is. All right. So yours will look something like that. See, I have Exodus to Malachi in my left hand, and I have the book of Genesis in my right hand. Now, if you put those together, 929 chapters, 4,000 years of history. 4,000 years. Now, <clears throat> if I ask you, which one do you suppose has more years covered, your right hand with the book of Genesis, or your left hand with the books of Mal uh, Exodus through Malachi, what would you say? Most people would say, well, surely all those pages cover more years than those few pages, but you'd be wrong. The book of Genesis covers 2,500 of the 4,000 years of the Old Testament. One book. And then 1,500 years from Malachi, from Exodus through Malachi, 1,500. 2,500, 1,500. Now, in the book of Exodus, of course, the law of Moses, it, it records the law of Moses being given on Mount Sinai, and Moses' law was in effect for 1,500 years. So that's how long the rest of the Old Testament covers is that 1,500 years because as soon as the old, you get out of the Old Testament, of course, Jesus nailed the law to the cross. So you have those 1,500 years. It's sort of like this. Um, the book of Genesis. If, have you ever gone to a lake and taken a flat, smooth stone and uh, skipped it? Well, the first jump is a big one, right? And then a medium one and then some small ones and it sinks. That's the way the Bible is. It starts off with a big jump. A lot of years. And what, what Moses is doing through the Spirit in the book of Genesis is just hitting the highlights of human history in the, early, in the early days of mankind. Just the highlights, skipping from one to the next. Now look at the book of Genesis with me. You've, you've had, you know, the whole Old Testament. Now we're just going to look at Genesis. Go and put in your right hand, chapters 1 through 11, and in your left hand, chapters 12 through 50. 1 through 11 and 12 through 50. This is the natural division of the book of Genesis. What, what you have in chapters 1 through 11, which of course is the smaller number of pages again compared to 12 through 50, and if I ask you, guess which one has the most years in it, you're probably going to guess, well, now I'm on to you, and you'd be right. There are more years covered in the fewer pages of chapters 1 through 11 than in the, more, the greater number of pages, chapters 12 through 50. In uh, chapters 1 through 11, 2,500 years in the whole book, 2,100 years, chapters 1 through 11. Those are the big jumps. And then chapters 12 through 50, only 400 years. Because in the first uh, 11 chapters, he looks at four events, four major events in human history. Creation, fall, flood, tower. It's easy to remember. Creation, fall, flood, tower the creation of the world and of man, the fall of man, Genesis 3, which we'll look at in a moment, 
the flood, which destroyed mankind and started over with just Noah and his family. And then the Tower of Babel, that is significant because it explains why we have the different languages and people groups of the earth, because they were separated because they tried to build that tower unto heaven, and God separated them, and they went in different directions, and then they developed uh, culturally and uh, biologically even, uh, the people groups changed over time, and the languages were confused, and that's why we have all the languages. All right, that's what you have in the first four of the first 11 chapters, those four events, creation, fall, flood, tower, chapters 1 through 11. In chapters 12 through 50, you have four people, four events, now four people. And it's a, fa it's a father, son, grandson, great-grandson. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That's why the numbers shrink, because you've got four consecutive lifespans. Even though they lived a lot longer than we do, they only lived four centuries combined. What is it, 100 and, 175, 180, 147, 110 years for those four? And they overlapped, of course, but all together four centuries. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now what God is doing, the first 11 chapters, he's showing how we got here and how the, and how the world came to be the way it is. Then in chapters 12 through 50, he narrows the focus down and begins to talk about salvation through Abraham and Abraham's descendants. So he no longer was talking about all the world, just one nation of the world, one people group, the Jews, who would be the who were chosen to be God's people, that through whom the Savior would eventually come. So what you have is 1 through 11, 20, 2100 years, 12 through 50, 400 years, four events, four people. That's the book of Genesis. Now that's all the numbers I'm going to throw at you till we get to the New Testament. So just you, know, you won't remember all those. That's okay, but you get the big point. Now what we're going to do is look at some verses, and this part you will remember. Let's go to Genesis 3, and let's talk about the reason for the whole Bible. What's the Bible about? If you had to, in one sentence, say, the Bible is about dot, 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 how would you complete that ellipsis? Well, here, here is one way to do it. The Bible records the salvation of man through Christ to God's glory. It doesn't matter where you read in the Bible, that's what it's about. But let's talk about that word salvation. What did man need to be saved from? Sin. That's Genesis 3. God, played, God made Adam and Eve. Made Adam, then from his rib made Eve. We touched on that last night. Put them in the garden, gave them... One forbidden tree, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, gave them an occupation, dress and keep the garden, and he would come down and fellowship with them in the cool of the day. But chapter 3 verse 1 says there was a serpent who was more subtle than any beast of the field. That serpent we better know is Satan or the devil. So you have, the, you have in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 the tempter, his target Eve and his tactics, which are three. One is to cause doubt. Two is to deny God. And three is to substitute something else. The same three things he does to us. Genesis 3, 1, The serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? That's, that's doubt. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and then Eve responds. She said, we can eat of everything except one. And she adds to what God actually said. And she says, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God didn't say that. And then in verse uh, 5, uh, no, verse 4, a serpent said, you shall not surely die. So he denies that the Bible is true or the Word of God is right. Now, now what, what does evolution do to our young people in school? Or to whoever watches a, a movie or reads a book or... Same thing. But you don't still believe the Bible, do you? <laughs> you know that, that creation story? It's talking snakes and all that. You don't believe all that, do you? Deny the Word of God. But then he substitutes. For God doth know that in the day that either of you your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see, God's, God's trying to keep you from having any fun. God's trying to make your life, keep you... Uh, at a disadvantage. He doesn't want you to be like him. 
See, he's, he's not fair. Well, what does the devil tell us? It's more fun not to be a Christian. You know, God's just trying to keep you from having fun. Everybody else having fun. Why can't Christians have fun? Same thing today, isn't it? Well, then Eve, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and tree to be desired to make one wise. What were those three temptations? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. 1 John 2.15, Matthew 4, Luke 4, we studied last night from Matthew. Same thing here. She, it was good for food, that's flesh. She saw it looked good. She would be as God. So proud of life. Same thing he's trying to get us with. Well, she took it. She ate. She gave her husband also with her and he did eat. Perhaps there is some time lapse between um, the first part of verse 6 and the last part and gave also and her husband with her and did, he did eat. It seems when you compare 1 Timothy 2 8 through uh, 15, which talks about this, that the woman being deceived was in the transgression, but the man wasn't deceived. It seems like Eve was tricked by the devil. Maybe the devil caught her when she was away from Adam, which would make it easy, make an easier target. Then she gave to him, and he did eat, but he knew he was sinning. He went into it wide open. That's, that seems to be the most likely explanation when you compare those two passages those two passages. But the main point we're here to talk about tonight is this. Adam and Eve sinned and threw humanity over the falls, as it were. Because all of us, not guilty of their sin, not handed down genetically or any other way from our parents, but we have been guilty of following their example. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So all of us who've reached an age of accountability have given in to some kind of temptation, unless the eye, lust, flesh, pride of life. Not the same thing that Eve did or that Adam did, but just as guilty because we did something God said not to do or we did not do something that God said to do. Everybody's sin, therefore, all of us have the same problem. Because sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. We can't go to heaven as sinners. Because sin cannot be in the presence of pure holiness of God. So we had a problem. Adam and Eve had a problem first. Now God had a solution. And that's verse 15 of chapter 3. God comes down and He questions what they've done. Of course He knows, but He gets them to confess it. And then He begins to mete out punishments. The, the serpent, verse 14 now notice verse 15 in that section where he's punishing the serpent. And I will put enmity, that's in the same word family as enemy, something that's against us. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between the serpent and the woman. What woman? You might think Eve since she was there, but it's not Eve. And I wonder if they knew what God was saying here. Most likely Adam and Eve had no idea. And I suppose that even the the Jewish scholars down through the ages that had memorized and analyzed and discussed this passage did not fully understand what God had promised here. Now we can know for sure because we have the New Testament to tell us, but they didn't have the New Testament. Between thy seed, uh, thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is called the first gospel in the Bible, the first good news. came on a really dark occasion. Let me see if I can illustrate this first and then I'll explain it. If you go home tonight and you kick off your shoes and you remember that you did not get the mail and you have a mailbox at the end of your driveway and so you walk down the driveway but somewhere along the way in the dark you step on a stone, a rock and uh, bruise your heel. You'll, you'll hop around, you know, you'll get back to the house you won't go to the emergency room with that, right? I mean, tomorrow you'll, you might limp a day or two, but then it'll be over. Let's say on the way home tonight that you're involved in an automobile accident and you have a head injury. Well, they're going to rush you to the emergency room and they're going to put you in the hospital. And that might be a wound from which you will not recover. You see what he's saying here? He said the seed of woman is going to have the equivalent of a bruised heel. But the devil is going to have the equivalent of a crushed head. 
Now, if you stomped on a snake, you might bruise your heel. But if you got him on the head just right, well, that would be the end of the snake, right? Now, what does that mean? We understand the imagery now, but what does it mean? We're going to see toward the end of our lesson from Galatians 3 that this seed is Christ. Now, just as a preview, we're not going to go there yet. So if the seed of woman is Christ, we talked about last night the only one ever born of a virgin. There's no doubt about who the seed of woman is because Jesus is the only one who was ever born of a virgin. The seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent. When did that happen? Calvary. You see, the devil thought he won when Jesus was hanging on that cross that we closed with last night. He had extinguished the life of the one who was the Savior of the world. And he's in the tomb and they roll the rock. There's a party in hell about that time. But Sunday morning, what happened to that stone? What happened to that body? He was alive again. You see, Jesus, as awful as crucifixion was, how long did it hurt Him for? Three days? Like bruising your foot? What about the devil? When Jesus came out of that tomb, how long did that hurt Him? Forever. He crushed His power. I mean, He's living on by time. He's, he's going to be cast out. He already lost. We know who won. Jesus won. The only question is whether we'll be on Jesus' side at the end or whether we'll be on the devil's side because we're going to go with one or the other, but Jesus already won. That's what Genesis 3.15 is talking about. God gave hope on the day when they had plunged themselves into hopelessness and sin. So I will say about Genesis 3, that's an important chapter to understand or you want to understand the rest of the Bible if you don't know the problem of sin. Now I'll go to Genesis 12. We mentioned that there is a change here between the big jumps of the stone, the skips, and the small um, jumps between these four lives. We won't spend any time talking about the other three, just the promise made to Abraham here. Abraham uh, grew up in Ur, or lived in Ur of the Chaldees. They've excavated this town. It, by ancient standards, it was quite impressive, even we, we might say modern. It had wide streets that were straight. Houses were laid out on a grid. Some of the houses had 20 rooms. Now, I don't have 20 rooms in my house. Do you have 20 in your house? Probably not. So Abraham, judging from comparing his wealth with others during that time, quite possibly lived in one of those nice houses. He was 75 years old. God comes to him and says, I want you to leave home. Not too many people move when they're 75. You know, you pretty much want to stay where you are when you're 75. But Abraham, so being the man of faith that he was, left. Now can you imagine that conversation? I don't know where Abraham, God appeared to Abraham. Let's just say it was out in the yard or out in the field. And uh, Abraham gets this message, vision from God. And it seems like incidentally God's talking to these patriarchs fairly often. But on average, he only appears to them once every 400 years in the book of Genesis. So it's not very often. But here he, he appears to Abraham. Abraham comes in. Can you imagine the conversation? Sarah! I'm back here. Guess what? We're moving. What? <laughs> yeah, we're moving. Where are we moving to? I don't know. <laughs> but pack up because we're moving. Hebrews 11 says, He went not knowing whither He went. In other words, hit the road and God will tell us after we get out there. Now that takes faith, doesn't it? And Ur of the Chaldees was a, an idolatrous city, so God's moving him away from idolatry. His father goes with him, goes until he dies in Haran a little later. But all that is really um, to set up a discussion of the promise that God made to Abraham, which is why we're reading this section. Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now here's the first promise. And I will make of thee a great nation. The nation promise. 
Now, how many children did Abraham have at this point? 75 years old, his wife's 65. They don't have a child together. It would have been quite a promise to say, I'm going to make of you a great family. And that would have pleased him. But that's not what God said. I'm going to make of you a great nation. That's a lot of families. A lot of descendants. In fact, later, he will renew this promise. Your descendants will be like the stars of the sky or like the sand of the seashore. In other words, you can't count them all. I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. Did you know that Christian Jews and Muslims all revere Abraham to this hour? Is his name great in the earth? Even to this thousands of years later, God kept that promise, didn't he? Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, and here's the second promise, shall all families of the earth be blessed. There you have the seed promise. Through Abraham's lineage, his great, 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 great. Well, there's 42 names in Matthew 1 that starts with Abraham. And there's some skips, so it's a little bit, it's even more than that. But 42 generations later, let's say, he, there was a young Jewish girl who had a baby whose name was Jesus. He had Abraham's genes. He had, Ab he had Abraham's blood coursing through his veins. God had kept that promise. And in that way, God blessed all the nations of the earth through Abraham because Jesus was of his lineage. And all men can come to salvation through Jesus, not just the Jews, not just those who lived during that period or the period when Jesus lived or in that part of the world, but all men everywhere in all time are blessed by Jesus. That's the seed promise. And then he makes a land promise in verse 7, the, go into this land and I'll give it to you. And that promise is kept in the book of Joshua. All right, that's all I'm going to say now about the Old Testament. Uh, except I will give you an outline before we move to our second point of the Old Testament. And we took a break on the numbers, but here's some more numbers. If you like numbers, here we go. If you want to outline the Old Testament, it's easy. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. You can hardly forget it once you hear it. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. What, is the, what do those numbers represent? Five books of law, 12 books of history, five books of poetry. I'll say it again. Some of you are trying to write this. Five books of law, 12 books of history, five books of poetry, five major prophets, 12 minor prophets. What's the difference in a major and minor prophet? How long the book is. Isaiah, 66 chapters. Obadiah, one chapter. So you can see which one's... The message is just as important, but fewer chapters. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Law, history, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets. That's an overview of the Old Testament. Now we're moving to point number two. Point number two is the day the transition occurred between the old law and the new law. Very important. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to be able to divide the word of truth. One of the ways that we divide it is between covenants, between the old covenant and the new covenant. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and see to whom was the first law given. That's going to help us to make the deduction of when it ended. Deuteronomy 5, 2, and 3. This Deuteronomy is the second law. It's when God gave the law to Moses. Uh, he gave it to him in Exodus, but then when Moses was old, he was not going to be able to go in with the children of Israel into the Canaan's land, so he reinterprets the law or preaches some sermons based on the law that help them to understand how to apply the principles of the law, not to a nomadic people who are living in tents and traveling all the time, all their lives, but how to apply the law to a settled people because they're going to go into the land of Canaan, live in cities they didn't build, drink from wells they didn't dig, eat from fruit, fruit from trees they didn't plant. So now the law is reinterpreted for that new environment. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says, And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Here, I'm in verse 1, 
Uh, Deuteronomy 5 verse 1, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. Now watch this. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. What's Horeb? Another name from Mount Sinai. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers. Did you know that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph never kept the law of Moses? Even the Sabbath. Now God set aside the Sabbath in Genesis 2, but there was no law to honor it until Moses. That's, as we've already seen, 2,500 years later. What you have here is this law was made with the people who were here today, Moses' generation, not with any of those who have gone before. Now that was uh, 430 years before. The promise to Abraham was in 1921 B.C., Genesis 12, 1921. This is 1491, 430 years. We know exactly how long because Gen uh, Galatians 3 tells us it was 430 years between the two. Now, notice... The verse 3, the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, all of whom all are, who are all of us here alive this day. So you have the people, Israel, was it made of the Gentiles? I, I don't know about your lineage, but I suppose based on population statistics, there would be a very Unlikely chance there's even a single Jew. I'm not talking about religious, religion, I'm talking about lineage or bi biology in the attendance here tonight. Probably all of us share Gentile blood. That We would not have been under the law even if we had lived during the time that the law was in effect. Now, it was made with Moses and that generation and the subsequent generations down to the time when Jesus came, 1,500 years. So that's significant. That tells us when the law was given. Now go with me to, De to Hebrews chapter 8. There are three books in the New Testament that talk about the change of the law. In fact, we won't have time to look at all three, but in my notes we have chapters from all three of these to look at. It's Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Those three books talk about the change of the law. We'll start here in Hebrews 8. Go up to verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more... The he there is Jesus. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Notice, better. That's the key word of the book of Hebrews. I think it's used 13 times. Next time you read the Hebrews, put a box or highlight the word better every time. And, uh, that's, that will jump out at you and you'll see the key idea here. What he's saying is some of these Jews that had been under the law before Christianity came and they were converted to Christianity, but then they started being persecuted and they said, you know, it's easier to be a Jew. I think I'll go back and have my old religion. And Paul, if he be the writer of Hebrews, is saying, you can't go back. It's better to be a Christian. Everything is better. Well, the law is better in chapter 8. A better covenant which is established upon better promises, and if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. First covenant, second covenant. What's he talking about? Law of Moses, Old Testament, Law of Christ, New Testament. It's that simple. Now, it says that the Old Testament had a fault. Did God give a faulty law? No. The fault of it was nobody could keep it. People lived under it for more than a thousand years. And guess how many of them were able to keep it without breaking any, any of the laws? Zero. <laughs> Until Jesus came. And Jesus kept it. He's the only one. We couldn't have kept it either. Now, the pro now we can't keep the Jesus law perfectly either. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is, when you sinned in the Old Testament and broke that law, what sacrifice could you make? An animal. But Hebrews 10.4 says it's not possible to blood of bulls and goats take away sins. It was a temporary solution, but it wasn't permanent. Um, there's a little tidbit for you. Next time you read Luke, in Luke 9, it talks about the 
transfiguration of Jesus when he went up in the mountain with Peter, James, and John. His face shone brightly, his clothes as no fool on earth could make them. And there appeared unto him in the mount Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets. And they talked that night. You remember the disciples were asleep at first and then Peter woke up and said, let's make three tabernacles. God said, no, this is my son. You remember that? What do they talk about? You're a really good Bible student if you know that off the top of your head, but let me tell you. They talked about Jesus' decease. Well, that's a little morbid. <laughs> Why are they talking about Jesus dying for? If Jesus had not died and been resurrected, would Moses have been saved or lost? Would Elijah have been saved or lost? How many people would have been saved that Jesus didn't die on the cross? Nobody. Old Testament or New Testament. Nobody would have been saved. They're pretty interested in Jesus' death, aren't they? Because it, it will determine whether they go to heaven or hell. It's interesting. That's what he's talking about here. The Old Testament, when you violated it, there was no sacrifice. That, Hebrews 9.15, for lack of a better way to say this, rolled the sins forward the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur every year, when the high priest went in with the blood and sprinkled it in the most holy place on the mercy seat. Leviticus 16. Well, when he did that, all those that he was representing were okay again. But then they were guilty again the next year. And he had to do that every year. And if Jesus, that was all in prospect though. If Jesus had never come, all that was for nothing. It didn't do any good at all, ultimately. But because Jesus did come, his blood, you know, Jesus died on Mount uh, Golgotha or Calvary on the hill. And metaphorically speaking, his blood rolled down the hill and covered all the sins of the Old Testament faithful. And it rolled down the other side of the hill and covered all the sins of the people that would live after the cross. Jesus is the Savior of the world. His blood is the only sacrifice that can save. So that tells us, um, <clears throat> that, that, that answers the question of, uh, the Old Testament was given to the children of Israel. It was temporary. It only lasted until, now let's go to Galatians 3, and let's answer the specific time when, the law was done away. I mentioned that there are three books that talked about the Old Testament law being done away. Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. We're going to the second one, Galatians. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, Genesis. Uh, Genesis. Galatians 3. Let's start in verse uh, 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? What's the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. You know, there's something about sin that seems innocuous. It seems innocent. You know, you commit a sin and it likely brings you pleasure and no immediate consequences. Well, sin doesn't seem so bad. It seems pretty good, you know. It felt good. Nothing bad happened to me. But sin's awful. Sin destroys. That was the purpose of the Old Testament law. was added because of transgressions. Now, in the Old Testament, when you sinned, depending on what kind of sin, but you had to go out to your flock and pick out one of your animals. Now, now shepherds are pretty close to their sheep. They, they loved them. Pick out one of them, take him to the priest, and kill him because of sin. I used to think the priest did the killing on Day of Atonement, but it's not what the Bible says. The head of the family killed the animal. The priest caught the blood and sprinkled it. Now sin seems exceedingly sinful, doesn't it? You mean my sin made my animal die? Well, that was the purpose of law, make sin. Because, you know, the hardest thing about converting people today, it's not getting them to understand the plan, it's to get them to see that they need the plan. They think they're all right. You know, I'm, I'm, man, I'm not perfect, but I'm a pretty good person. I'm not, you know, that's not the point. Have you ever sinned one time? Well, yeah. I sinned a bunch of times. But you're not all right. You're lost. Because sin separates from God. Sin is bad. Well, that was the point of the law. 
Then notice the when in this verse, till, that's an adverb of time, up to that point in time, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Remember we started talking about a seed in Genesis 12 a long time ago? We're back to the seed. Who is the seed? Well, look at verse 16, there's no doubt. And Abraham and his seed were the promises made. We saw that, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. That promise was renewed to Isaac and Jacob later in the book. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's seed came through Christ. Now, go to Colossians chapter 2. And let's answer the question, what day did the law end, the Old Testament law end? Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. Handwriting of ordinances. The only law that was handwritten was the one written by the finger of God on Mount Sinai and presented to Moses. Exodus 18.26. Might be 36. Exodus 18. God wrote it, gave it to Moses, handwritten ordinances. First commandment, second, third, all the way down to ten. Now, took it out of the way. When? Nailing it to his cross. The day the law changed between the Old Testament having, you know, somebody having to keep the Old Testament laws and those who are responsible for the gospel or the New Testament was when Jesus died on the cross that day. And I said we could nail down the hour. We won't take time to do this because our time's almost gone. But you can write down Mark 15, 25 through 34, and you can find the hour. And you got two choices. I'll tell you what my judgment is, and you might pick the other one. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. So the law was nailed to the cross either at 9 o'clock in the morning when Jesus was nailed there, or at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus died. My judgment is that it, when he said it is finished at 3 o'clock, the law was finished, along with the only perfect life ever lived, his life. All right, and that's, that's all we'll say about the transition. Now, as we close, let's talk about an overview of the New Testament. Now, we began by holding the pages of the Old Testament in our hands. What we're going to do as we end is look at the New Testament, and this will also serve as our invitation. What I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview of the New Testament. We said that there were 929 chapters in the Old Testament. There are 260 in the New Testament. There are 23,145 verses in the Old Testament. There are 7,957 verses in the New Testament. You don't need to remember that necessarily. Some people like numbers. The New Testament covers, we said this was 4,000 years. 100 years. So not very much time. Well, common sense will tell you that. What, what does the New Testament begin with? The birth of Christ. How long did he live? 33 years. Then the church went from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So you got that generation, 100 years. The book of Revelation, um, most, most scholars dated about A.D. 95. It's almost 100 years after the birth of Christ. So that's 100 years is what you have covered in the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> um, there are three kinds of people. Gus Nichols used to say uh, there are three kinds of people in the world. And everybody in here is one of these three kinds. And I hope that you will self-judge yourself correctly as I talk about these and then react according to where you are <laughs> to the grace and the love of God and the message of Scripture that we studied tonight. Unbelievers, number one, do not believe in God, do not believe in the Word of God, do not believe in the Son of God, do not believe in heaven or hell. i uh, got a, a friend, I work in McDonald's a lot of mornings now. Our office was destroyed in a tornado. And there's another guy in there, a uh, young guy, maybe in his 20s. Long story short, we got to talking he was in there. He's a writer too, incidentally. So we got to talking, and we have a good relationship. But he's an atheist. You know, he'll say, he calls me the preacher. And he'll ask Bible questions, you know. We, we get, I gave him a ride the other day to 
where he needed to go. So in real good terms, he's an unbeliever. He does not believe that I'm, he believes that I am wasting my time preaching a meeting here. You're wasting your time sitting in these pews listening to this old book. Unbeliever. That's one group. Second group, believers. Believe in the Bible. Believe in the God of the Bible. Believe in the Son of God. Believe in heaven. Believe in hell. Believers. Um, John 20, 30, and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus, the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then the third group, followers. John 1, 12 says that those that believe had the power to become sons of God. And there are people, and you know some of them, I'm sure. This might be somebody like this in attendance here tonight, or watching on Facebook Live, that will say, yeah, I believe in God. Of course there's a God. There's a world. There has to be a world maker. There are people that will say, my mama read the Bible to me. I believe, I believe the Bible's the Word of God. They'll say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe He died for my sins. I believe in the resurrection. But they won't be here Sunday. They weren't here last Sunday. They're not living the gospel, according to the gospel. They're a believer in the sense that they would not deny what the Bible says, but they haven't followed Jesus. Luke 9.23 says that we must deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow Him in order to be saved. Did you know that the New Testament is put together, and we're going to sing our song here just after this, so that if a person was lost and began to read the New Testament with a good heart and began in Matthew and ended in Revelation, it would carry him all the way through the plan of salvation to heaven. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are they about? Believe in Jesus. The book of Acts. What's that about? How to become a Christian. After you believe, what's next? Be baptized, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, become a part of the church. A believer, a baptized believer, a member of the church, what do you need to know then? How to live faithfully, how to live the Christian life, how to worship God. Romans through Jude, that's what those books are about. And then what do you need to know after you've lived the Christian life, you've worshiped God, you're nearing the end? You need an assurance. Where am I going? What's next? Where do I go next? What's the book of Revelation about? Brother uh, Johnny Ramsey preached a lot of Revelation. He used to say the theme of Revelation is if you overcome, you get to come over and live with me. That's what it's about. So where are you in the New Testament? Are you in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John becoming a believer? Or are you in the book of Acts needing to be baptized tonight? Are you in the Christian letters, have you lived a faithful Christian life? Do you need to make anything right tonight? And are you prepared to go to the place that Revelation talks about when the end comes? We'll talk about later in this meeting. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come? We'll stand while we sing.